Welcome to Local is Lekker, where we look for local businesses with a lekker story. And in this episode, we visit Max at the Saviour Brand Company, which is upstairs from the popular Saviour Cafe here in Glenwood. My name is Max. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, the Saviour Brand Company. Um, so we're both a cafe and we're a leather goods manufacturer. I guess the idea was born um, somewhere in 2011. Um, we were making goods, leather goods by hand, quite crudely. Um, it was the early tech boom. Uh, our phone fours were all the rage. <laughs> and we had a couple of mates that uh, wanted some leather iPhone sleeves. And so we sort of designed a little pouch or a little sleeve. And um, that's where we started, just uh, hand sewing iPhone sleeves and that led to the iPad sleeve and that led to the mini iPad and to messenger bags and handbags and all sorts of fun little things. But the idea was originally birthed out of um, trying to create employment or skill set to train young guys coming out of children's homes, guys and girls. And uh, we did that for some years and we sort of branched out from that and we included people that just wanted to learn how to do hobbyist leather or it was a starting point to a journey. Uh, we weren't sure where the journey was going and nor were they, but that's sort of where we were at. And so 2011, 2012, 2013 was um, trying to find the, the headspace for that because we'd never been involved in anything like this and there were lots of socio-economic issues to overcome and um, things that we realized we didn't have the skill set for, uh, just like the psychosocial sort of aspect of it, how to deal with people coming from broken environments. We just had no clue. So the real story is I coached football, Little League football at Stella. And this is how we came into the space is uh, back in 2008, I wanted to spend more time with my kid. I was doing a lot of traveling. So we were doing, uh, I was coaching little league football and this team arrived to play a game and it was a kid, some kids from a children's home in Sydenham. And these kids had nothing. It just it was terrible. And our team were the United Nations uh, the Rainbow Nation team, they were, we had young black kids, young white kids, Indian kids, colored kids. All of them had the best kit, you know, Adidas boots, Puma boots, Nike boots, great uniform. Um, and we thrashed them. It was like 15 nil at half time. And yet the kids on the other team, biggest smiles you've ever seen, you know. And I think in that moment, um, both my wife and I sat on the side of the field and we just, we cried for like half an hour, just at the... So we got involved with the children's home and helped them in certain things and we, we got funding for them and we just got involved at like an arm's length, but we were still involved. And that sort of, that thing was the, the real seed for wanting to help kids gain a skill set. But it was a journey and we were on it. And so in 2014, we, uh, early 2014, we signed a, a lease um, for a, a space in Station Drive, um, along with the guys from Distillery 031 and the Holmes Brothers and a few other creatives. We were part of this uh, creative and s this creative sort of precinct coming alive in Durban. And so that also gave us the opportunity to partner with bigger organizations like the Mr. Price Foundation to bring in young guys to learn this art and the skill set and have a vision for design. And um, yeah, we learnt a lot along the way and it wasn't easy. There were days that we want to, we didn't have money to pay rent and um, wages and uh, you know, it was, it was tough, it was a long road. And so um, I think the business sort of evolved into a handbag business. You know, we had uh, this Brogue tote that we made in 12 or 13 different colors and we had 30 or 40 bags on the, the shelf and people would come in and say, I love this color and I love this bag, but can I have it in that style? 
and sort of the more we had those interactions, the more we sort of realized that we weren't an off-the-shelf type company. We were more excited about uh, creating, call it customized product or bespoke product. But at that point in time, we were sort of in a space where our skill set itself was still quite raw and rough and we were learning processes along the way. Um, we were buying sort of like we'd see a tool and we'd just go ahead and buy it, yeah, just in case we may need it at some point. We got money in the account, let's buy the tool kind of vibe. And a lot of the times we didn't even really know how to use those tools or pieces of machinery, but we, we sort of had them. And it was a process of, um, we were self-taught and self-learning and there wasn't a lot of information out there. It was the early days of this maker movement sort of thing. So we could go to Tandy Leather and you would see how you could do sort of a half Spanish braiding kind of vibe. But there wasn't any real information in terms of uh, putting gussets in place and different styles of gussets and how you would line a bag and how you would put reinforcement in and you know all of that sort of information was held quite tightly by these incredible artisans in, in, in Europe with like houses like Hermes, you know, just big secret. <laughs> and so um, 2015, 2016, 2017, we weren't really moving we wanted to be in that space, but we weren't really getting there as quickly as we wanted. So I sort of fell out of love with leather. It was sort of more of a means to an end. Um, and my focus sort of moved towards our cafe, which in Station Drive had been a little bolt-on room to the leather studio. It was like a room with a coffee machine and pre-made sandwiches, and that was it. And that's sort of where Saviour Cafe was birthed in that space. And so moving into a bigger space, um, we sort of uh, popped out the cafe. We sort of grew the menu, full breakfast menu, full lunch menu, different coffee offerings. Um, and that sort of just took on a life of its own and, and ballooned. And it was a, a really welcome um, development after Station Drive. Station Drive became super congested, uh, loads of issues with parking. And so we saw a direct correlation between no parking and no turnover, you know. And so we moved into Glenwood and it was a welcome relief having lots of parking available and we were in a period listed house um, and we blew out the menu, how our turnover reacted to that. And so um, I've sort of put leather at the back of my mind for the longest time. And um, Late 2018, a friend of mine came through and said, I need this briefcase to go to the UK and my leather guys had gone on leave. So I ended up going into a room and locking the door and just sort of saying a briefcase. And sort of in that process, I think prophetically, I just fell back in love with leather again. And just said, if we're going to do this and we're going to continue to do this, there has to be a continual escalation. So we, our thing is, we want to be consistent, but we want to grow consistently also. So that we not only want a great level of quality, but we want to continually incre increase our quality and skill set whilst we're on this path. And so with this new love for leather, it was just like starting afresh, but with a, a different knowledge and mindset, we were able to take this into a different space and to say, this is where leather is in our space now, and this is where we want to be, how do we get there? And it was a tough journey of whilst we still having to pay rent and buy materials and then buy new tools and new equipment. Um, because we were more focused in terms of where we wanted to be, we were able to refine those choices and saying, I like those tools, but I don't need them. They're not going to form part of our skill set. This is where we need to be. And so to focus our acquisition into that space. And so now when we offer leather lessons, we do a very uh, comprehensive uh, course that allows you to make a wallet. But then I say to you, before you make any decisions in terms of tool purchases or whatever, there's European leather work, there's American Western leather work, there's British leather work, and then there's Japanese leather work. You need to determine where you want to sort of focus your skills, and I can help you 
by training you further in that space and helping you buy tools in that space or telling you which tools you will need um, instead of going out there with this broad shotgun approach. We're just going to buy everything, but we might not need it, you know. So in the last two years, we've ramped up our skill set um, and we've uh, ramped up our, just in terms of the look that we want to achieve. We've, we've, we've changed that completely. Um, and our methodology that goes into that. So, so as we see people's needs change, so are the design element changes. This is a really heavy structured sort of bag wallet that uh, would never be in your pocket, it would always be in your bag. Um, and it's sort of a bit of a statement piece. Uh, move towards something a lot more uh, structured. This is a biker inspired um, calfskin wallet, beautiful. And then we see people's n needs change and move away from, for example, a traditional bar fold, which has four, six, or eight card slots with a money fold, into something that is either structured like a, a crocodile skin card slip or card wallet, card case. And that might move into something like this, which is uh, custom dyed uh, crocodile skin, uh, both sides on a beautiful calf skin back that's been lined with French goat. So that entails taking a piece of leather that is maybe 1.6 or 1.7 millimeters thick and then making it narrower. So essentially taking the meat out of the back of the leather um, to about 0.5 mils for both the goat leather and for the calf leather, bonding them together, um, edge coating them, creasing them, uh, and then hand stitching it with uh, a European linen. So this linen thread is made in France, and then we buy it. Um, and then you can get something that's really bespoke or really unique that you won't find anywhere else. So that's sort of the space that we like to be in. Um, likewise, with this little little bag, you can feel whimsical and go out with this bag today. Um, it's a nice little carry bag, beautiful little ochre leather piece, lots of hand stitching detail, leather core handles. And then on the inside, um, it's lined with navy French goatskin. Got a little pocket, little magnets. And then if you're feeling like you want to have a hands-free day, um, we can pop on the strap. And so I can have a cute little uh, crossbody tote. Um, and the nice thing is the product that you see in the store is literally just product to show you what we're capable of making. You can come into the store and you can choose a lime green or even just the plain black. You can choose white leather for the interior or you can choose gold. Um, you can determine the length of your strap. You can determine the color of your feet. All of those little details are things that we are able to, to change and customize for our, for our customers. And those are the things that give us joy. Is someone will walk in and they don't have to take something that's on the shelf, use it as a, as a blank canvas and then build from there. Here is one of those first covers. So the big selling point was um, that you could put your phone in and then pull it out with a red tab. And so that was that was the thing. We ended up making this thing in like 14 or 15 different colors. Black, brown, tan, green, pink, apple green, forest green, grass green. Uh, we made it in yellow. This is uh, one that was in, in charcoal and they all had a red tape. Uh, we just managed to find a massive roll of this red tape and it sort of never ran out. But it sort of spoke to exactly what we were about. Um, yeah, this is still one of the first ones, and you can see the thread is, is thick and it's chunky, and it was a it was a learning process. It was fun, you know, um, and it still is fun. I think to almost be like a little child and, and be 
back involved with this is amazing. And I keep this as a reminder, not just to say um, we never want to go back to it, but this is the seed, this is where it all started. This grew into what we see around us today. This is the current version of the same, of the same um, sleeve. Now it's just in crocodile, um, edge, edge paint, iridescent French leather or French goat leather on the inside, and then uh, Fabrique en Afrique du Sud, made in South Africa. You know, um, same product, just one's a seed and one's a little bit more refined, I think. But uh, there are days I look at this and I'm, I'm still as excited as I was back then. So yeah, we used to send stuff all over the world as a single parcel via SA Post Office. And we've seen less and less of that and we've seen more local consumption, which speaks to the time that we're in, you know, buy local and all that sort of stuff. But I think it also speaks to the maker movement globally, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Singapore, even in the US and Europe, you see on Instagram now how many thousand leather workers there are. There are a lot, um, 100,000, 150,000. Um, some of them are not good and some of them are incredibly talented, you know. And so we haven't had an order go offshore to Australia or for the longest time, purely because there are people in those areas now that weren't doing this craft before that are investing in A, the tools, uh, the materials and the skill set. Um, and we see more of that. People are saying, can we come and do a lesson? Can you show us how this is done? And we're seeing a lot more of that coming. And so I think people are moving back to a time where that term slow fashion is a thing. You know, it's uh, we're going to make something by hand, intentionally, the right way for you. And that's what it's about. <laughs>